the uh, neuropsychological theory uh, actually shows that there are fundamental differences between men and women in the laboratory uh, when it comes to how they deal with um, negative or aversive stimuli. So if you um, give an electric shock to uh, men in a laboratory, their general reaction is one of anger, negative activation. Whereas if you give negative shocks to women in a laboratory, it's one of negative withdrawal. They get anxious. So there's differences in the way uh, m m m men and women's brains respond to uh, various stimuli. And the third, which is probably the most interesting theory, is sociological. Um, there might be a bias among clinicians uh, to diagnose antisocial traits in women because there is a greater social stigma attached to antisocial traits in women than there are in men. And there might also be a bias among women to not report antisocial traits because, because of that very social stigma. So it seems as though perhaps it's a confluence, it's a combination of developmental, neuropsychological, and also sociological factors that make it more prevalent in men than women. But also there's evidence that psychopathy might manifest itself, show up in a different way in women yeah. uh, than many, in men as well. Many years ago, there was a <coughs> Dutch uh, psychiatrist, a professor of psychiatry, his name was Karp, um, he wrote a book about psychiatry from the viewpoint, from the perspective of psychopathy. And he said that, uh, well, if things go wrong with boys, they become criminals. Mm. Maybe psychopaths. psychopaths. Mm. If things go wrong with, with girls, they become prostitutes. Mm. What do you think about yeah. that? Well, I think, you know, Karp is, is a, a Dutch uh, psychologist who was well ahead of his time because in the current era, uh, and this is 60 years, 60, 70 years on from when Karp was writing. Um, this 1941. Is, yeah, 70, 70, 70 years, yeah, seven decades. Um, this is now the current theory that actually um, psychopathic uh, characteristics might show up in a different way in women than they do in men. <clears throat> in men, they tend to show up as violent, generally it's violence, aggression, or manipulativeness. Uh, ruthlessness, whereas in women they tend to show up, we think, as more of a histrionic kind of personality, so more uh, sexually provocative, uh, more narcissistic, more manipulative. Uh, so we think that these traits might just be showing up in a different way in women than in men, but might have the same underlying causes and indeed bio biological basis. Yeah. The, the, this, this neurobiology thing <coughs> might be interesting. Because, mm. uh, I read in your book that you actually uh, uh, went to a laboratory where they could uh, uh, put uh, a, a so-called transcranial mm. magnetic st stimulation on your mm. prefrontal cortex. That's right. And, uh, and that, that caused some, yeah. something very interesting happening and you, could you tell us something about that? It, How you became uh, a psychopath? It did. For a it moment? turned me into a psychopath. Um, it's worn off. Uh, it only it wore off about a year ago. Um, it only it only lasted about half an hour. Um, but there is a technique uh, which we use in neuroscience, which a colleague of mine uses, called transcranial magnetic stimulation (TMS) for short. Uh, now the brain works using electrochemical signals. Okay. Now we know. Uh, that if we um, use transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is basically uh, pulsing, um, directing uh, electromagnetic waves uh, to specific areas of the brain, you can turn various areas of the brain up or down. Okay? You can interfere with the function of the brain. Um, it only works for about half an hour. Uh, but given that premise... Uh, because we know the areas of the brain of the psychopath, which are kind of different from the way normal brains function, we can target, in theory, uh, normal brains, and we can just turn those knobs up and down using this technique called, electro, uh, called um, uh, TMS, uh, electromagnetic pulses. So I thought that this would be a good idea, seeing that I'm writing a book on psychopaths. I should like, actually try this. No one had ever tried it before. Uh, so I went to the lab of my, uh, my colleague in, in Oxford, and um, he put this helmet on my head, and he turned my, did, you know, put the, put the magnetic pulses through. Um, and 
I'll cut a long story short. Um, it does feel very different. Um, I'll tell you how it feels. <coughs> it feels as if you have had half a bottle of wine, um, but you don't have the tiredness um, or the lethargy that goes with it. You have no anxiety. You lose all your inhibition, but you are still very switched on. <coughs> Um, and that's how it feels to be a psychopath. So the exact areas of the brain were the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the right temporoparietal junction. The right temporoparietal junction is the area of the brain which deals with moral decision-making. And the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain <coughs> which basically deals with emotions, okay, turns the emotions down a little bit. Uh, and it does feel very different. Um, so that's how it feels to be a psychopath. Half a bottle of wine, but without the, uh, without the accompanying tiredness. You have, all, you have none of those anxieties. You can do, feel you can do what you want. Nothing matters. Could it be a vodka martini shaken, not stirred? <laughs> well, that's, that's um, a very interesting point, because I think if, you're, if you want to find a functional psychopath, um, in the movies, you need look no further than James Bond. Um, James Bond is a classic functional psychopath. He's ruthless, he's fearless, uh, he's mentally tough, he's cool under pressure, he's focused, has little conscience, pretty, r not much empathy at all, really. He's a serial womanizer, uh, he's a risk taker, he's an adventurer. Uh, all he's doing is harnessing those he can kill people without batting an eye, uh, he's harnessing those psychopathic traits for the good of society rather than to its detriment. So, and I've, I've dealt with real-life real James Bonds. You know, I've tested people who work for the British Secret Service. Um, and, of course, they're not as, you know, fantastical as James Bond, but they do have that personality. Besides no of the womanizing point, I was thinking you were talking about our Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> I personally... Uh, you. Uh, our, our, our present prime minister, you mean? Yes. Or the president of Suriname? No, our prime minister <laughs> go here ahead. in Holland. <laughs> go ahead, go well, ahead. Of course, most of the politicians are psychopaths, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. There'd yeah. certainly be, there'd certainly, that's, that could well be the end of your legal career right there, I think. But, uh, <laughs> but, you, you mean, yeah, I, I, I'm going to try to preserve my career in academia. <laughs> I, heard, but, uh, <laughs> I heard something, something else. You were saying political paths. No? Oh, it is a nice, well, okay, we can I use think, that term yeah. too. I think if you look, I think Gerard's absolutely right. I think if you look at um, the, what politicians have to do, uh, when they're in office, especially political leaders, uh, they have to face pretty, pretty bad crises, anything from the threat from rogue nation states to uh, natural disasters. We saw that over in the eastern seaboard of the United States quite recently. They can't get too phased by these crises. They have to make tough decisions. They have to be pretty self-confident to run for office in the first place. They have to be very good at self-presentation skills. They have to be pretty mentally tough. And not every politician, not any politician has it all their own way. They have some pretty serious detractors. And they also have to, if not experience empathy, at least feign it, at least fake empathy uh, with the people who that they're, 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 they're interacting with and dealing with. So actually, um, you know, these traits in politicians are, are very beneficial. One senior UK politician said to me when I was writing this book, um, the only way in British politics uh, to see who's stabbing you in the back is to see their reflection in the eyes of the person stabbing you in the front. <laughs> and I've, I think that that is, that is very true, and I think Gerard is absolutely right. Okay, okay. We, we have just um, this picture of uh, Mr. James Bond. Um, maybe we can switch to, an, to another uh, famous um, character from the movies. Um, um, well, we, we could try uh, to uh, analyze uh, Mr. Hannibal Lecter together with you. This, I don't know if, you, if, if you're familiar with this, uh, this. Well, he happens to be a psychiatrist. I can't help it. But he's also a serial killer in this movie, The Silence of the Lambs. And um, well, not just an ordinary serial killer, but he uh, he used to eat his victims, and in this movie you can actually see him doing that. So, well, um, 
I thought it might be a nice idea to check whether he is a psychopath. Shall we do that? Okay, well, we have just uh, um, brought with us a list of some items, 12 items. You can see them here with that Dutch translation. And these 12 items are taken from a standard uh, psychopathy checklist, the shorter version, the checklist by uh, Robert Hare, a famous psychologist who has developed this checklist. And we might just go along and um, try to score these 12 items. Uh, on each item, you have three choices. Uh, you could ch uh, choose for zero, which is not present. This item is not present. You could choose for one, which is maybe or I don't know. Or you could choose for two. Two means, two means that this item is present. For example, if you think that Mr. Lecter was really someone who lacks remorse, number four, if you really think that, you could say, well, that's a two. If you say, well, this man is um, impulsive, and you doubt that, then you score one. If, if you look at item six, for example, and you say, well, uh, he does accept responsibility, then you would score a zero. Is that, is that clearly understood, yes? So now, um, what I would like to uh, suggest <laughs> is that at each item, you raise your hand when I mention zero, one, or two. And we'll, we'll just count the greatest number. Okay? Um, maybe before we start, uh, who of you do, does not know Hannibal Lecter? So if you don't know him, you better not participate. <laughs> if you don't know, guess. Let's guess. No. All right. Let's look at the first, the first item. Um, is he emotionally superficial, shallow, no deeper emotions? Maybe, maybe you can also uh, give some comment on these items, uh, mm. Kevin. Who of you would say that he is not superficial? That's, that's a zero. All right. Who of you would say maybe? And who of you would say that he is very superficial? Definitely. Well, this is a zero, isn't it? Yes. Yep. All right. Could you write it down, Tom? This is a zero. The second item, uh, grandiose. Overdreven gevoel van eigenwaarde, grandiose. Who of you would say that Hannibal Lecter is not a grandiose person. None of you. Mm. Who would say that he is? Clearly. Yes? <laughs> Who is doubting it? Oh, that's a clear two, two. isn't it? Mm. I've can I, can I ask of course. Can you please explain the use of this exercise? Uh, ah, we're going to show whether he is, according to this uh, scoring list, whether he is a psychopath or not. You see? Do you prefer another man or woman? <laughs> <laughs> okay, item three, uh, deceitful, manipulative. Who of you think that he is not man manipulative? Who, think, who thinks maybe, maybe? And who is sure that he is? Manipulative. Okay, that's a clear two. Uh, what about l lacking remorse? Item four. Who thinks that this is a zero? No remorse. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he, he shows remorse. That would be a zero. Who of you thinks that he maybe lacks remorse? Who of you thinks that he completely lacks remorse? Okay, that's a two. Number five, lacks empathy. Who of you think that he lacks empathy? Right? Who, who is in doubt? That's very, very close, isn't it? Yeah. Who thinks that he, uh, he does have empathy? Mm. Right. One, maybe. Uh, one, maybe, yeah? Yeah, one. OK, what about responsibility? That's number six. Who thinks that he does accept responsibility would be a zero? 
Okay, who thinks, who, who thinks that he doesn't accept re responsibility? Two. Doesn't accept responsibility would be a two. Yeah? yeah? What shall we choose? Should we say two? Yeah. Okay. Well, then we have the doubt. Uh, okay, that's the one. That's the one. That's one. Who is doubting? Yeah. Okay, now let's try one. Oh, one. Okay, I've noted that down. Uh, let's, let's try number seven. Who thinks that he is not impulsive? All right. Who is in doubt? <coughs> and who thinks that he is impulsive? Okay, that's a zero. Mm. Not impulsive. Yeah. Um, who thinks that he has poor behavioral controls? Who thinks he has poor behavioral controls? Who thinks he doesn't have poor behavioral controls? Okay, that would be two. Yeah. Um, who would say that he lacks goals? Who would say that he doesn't lacks, lacks goals? Yeah. Who is in two. doubt? Two. Okay, this is a zero, is it? Oh, the two, right? I think it's a zero. Yeah, two. Oh, um, he lacks goals. Who lacks goals? Yeah. yeah. It's a two? Okay. Uh, who, who would say that he is not irresponsible? No, who would say that he is irresponsible? Yes? Yeah. Who is in doubt? Okay. No, Oops. Say a one, eh? A one, yeah. Yeah. yeah, check nine. Yeah, let's check yeah. nine. Lex goals it's again. Zero. It's a zero, eh? Yeah. Isn't it? Yes. Other, That's what I thought. Red, yeah. yeah. Um, what about um, adolescent and social behavior? Who's, who thinks that there might be adolescent antisocial behavior with Mr. Lecter? Okay. Anyone in doubt? Who thinks there is, there is no antisocial behavior during adolescence? So that's a two, isn't it? Yeah. Um, adult antisocial behavior. Who thinks he, he shows adult antisocial behavior? Right. Who is in doubt? Who says that there is no adult antisocial behavior? OK, that's a clear two, isn't it? Yeah. OK. So, 14. So the total of score is 14. Um, Kevin, could you tell us what that might mean? Yeah, I think that actually what that shows, um, the score is, is 14. Um, I think what that shows is that we've, we've diagnosed the fact uh, that Hannibal Lecter, the most famous movie psychopath in Hollywood history, is not in fact a psychopath at all. <laughs> Um, now, this is very interesting because I and, my, and Antoine um, both um, did the same test on Hannibal Lecter and we came up with pretty much the same score uh, with a little bit of variation. And you may be wondering why this is. Well, actually, not to get into too long a story here, um, what this actually tells us is that there is, within the psychological community, actually a lot of debate about what it really means to be a psychopath. If you look at those questions in the, in the, hair, the hair checklist, this uh, psychopathy checklist, this very famous checklist, which was um, developed by the Canadian psychologist Robert Hare, um, the first thing that you need to remember about this checklist is that it's to be used only on members of the forensic or criminal community. It's not to be used on members of the general public because it, it's not a reliable predictor of psychopathic traits within the general public. It's too blunt an instrument, okay? But if you look at, at this particular um, uh, questionnaire, you'll see that the questions from one to six are very different uh, to the questions uh, ranging from seven to 12. The questions from one to six all look at social and emotional factors, manipulation, uh, lacking empathy and remorse, 
Whereas questions from 7 to 12 all look at behavior, okay? Now, there's a big debate within the, within the clinical and the, and the psychological community about whether both of these kinds of axes or dimensions, the antisocial behavior and the socio-emotional deficits, should be given equal weight. And I happen to be of the, um, the I take, happen to take the side, and I use this in my book, uh, that actually I, I, I think if we use that knobs on the, or dials on the studio mixing desk analogy, I don't think they should be. I think you can be a psychopath without necessarily being violent or breaking the law or killing anyone or raping anyone, okay, as, as I've just explained earlier. And I think what this test demonstrates, I think this actually is a, is a very powerful argument for my position, actually, that Hannibal Lecter, who we would all agree deep down is a psychopath, doesn't actually score psychopathically on this test. Um, now, I actually happen to know Robert Hare very well, the man who designed this test. Um, and funnily enough, he doesn't agree with me at all. Um, when did he design the test? He designed this test. Well, actually, this, it, it's been, uh, he, he originally designed it back in 1980. 1980. Well, we are now 30 years yeah. later, and perhaps it is so that society creates mm, yeah. this psychopaths. Mm. The goals and, uh, and the criteria of being successful in a society yes. yeah. means that people yeah. has to create, has to uh, be a, a psychopath. Maybe you should say that uh, a psychopath being a psychiatrist could never be a real psychopath. Yeah. I think, I think, first of all, the, um, if we look at, um, if, if we look at, um, I have to be careful, he's sitting beside me, you see. Uh, uh, um, I, think we ha I think we have to, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, a recent study shows that actually a very interesting thing is happening in society. Um, in American society, I can't say the same for Dutch or UK society, um, but a colleague of mine uh, at Harvard University uh, conducted a study looking at the empathy levels of college students aged between the 80, uh, ages of 18 and 21. And uh, she looked at empathy levels over the last 30 years. And she found that there has been a steady decline in empathy levels in college students over the last 30 years. In fact, they are now 40% less than what they were 30 years ago, with the steepest decline coming within the last 10 years. At the same time, narcissism levels among the same group of students are rising. Oh, that's in, good. Yeah. In fact, they've gone through the roof. So on one level, you've got empathy going down, and on the other level, you've got narcissism going up. And of course, in, 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 in the UK and in American society, we sometimes refer to the current generation as Generation Me. But I think there's, there's actually a lot of good points, I think, as, as, as Gerard was saying with that. You know, actually, there are some professions where, you know, you don't need too much empathy, and actually you need to be very... I mean, narcissism is just the sharp end of, of confidence. So, you know, we don't want to... One of the things people often say to me is, well, should we, if we could, should we get rid of psychopathic characteristics altogether? I don't think we should. I mean, remember what I was saying about you know, uh, the rescue services, law enforcement, people that work in the military. These people are all slightly higher on psychopathic characteristics than the rest of us. So okay. Not necessarily let's, a bad let's, thing. Let's find out uh, how psychopathic you are. Mm -hmm. Kevin, could, could, could you tell us how yeah. to use this self-test? Okay, well, what we've got here, as I say, this is a test which is used primarily and should always be used on, on members of the forensic uh, uh, population. I've developed a little test uh, which is a far more sensitive um, test of general psychopathic predispositions within the general population, okay? And we're going to do this, okay? And we're going to see if we've got any psychopaths in the house, okay? <laughs> you mean, you mean uh, uh, functional psychopaths? Functional psychopaths, yeah. <laughs>
Okay, folks, has everyone, has everyone got a questionnaire? Put your hand up if you don't have a questionnaire yet. Just a couple there. Okay, folks. So you'll see at the top of the questionnaire you've got um, a scoring system, okay? You've got, first of all, you've got 11 statements on the page in front of you there. Um, now, if you think that that statement strongly agrees with the description of you, you think that applies to you, then give, it, give yourself three points. If you think that it agrees with you, it describes you okay, give yourself two points. If you think it doesn't describe you, give it one point. And if you really disagree, if you really say, no, that's not me at all, give yourself zero points. So number one, I rarely plan ahead. I'm a spur of the moment kind of person. If that's you, really, really you, give yourself three points. Cheating on your partner is okay, so long as you don't get caught. <laughs> Yeah, I can see some people looking at the questionnaire of the person next to them there. <laughs> yeah. Always a bad thing. Okay. Number three. Number three. If something better comes along, it's okay to cancel a long-standing appointment. Okay? Now, the main thing here, folks, is you've got to be honest, okay? You've got to be absolutely honest. Okay, number four. Seeing an animal injured or in pain doesn't bother me in the slightest. Number five. Driving fast cars, riding roller coasters and skydiving appeal to me. Number six. It doesn't matter to me if I have to step on other people to get what I want. Number seven. I'm very persuasive. I have a talent for getting other people to do what I want. I think we've got a couple of psychos in the house already, actually, folks. I don't think we need a scoring system. Number eight. I'd be good in a dangerous job because I can make my mind up quickly. Don't think too long about that one. Number nine. I find it easy to keep it together when others are cracking under pressure. Number 10. If you're able to con someone, uh, that's their problem. They deserve it. Con, to trick or cheat. Yeah, thanks. And finally, number 11. Most of the time when things go wrong, it's somebody else's fault, not mine. Okay. Now, what you should have there, folks, you should have 11 numbers. You should have circled 11 numbers. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to add them up and write your total down at the bottom of the page. Everyone got a total? Okay. Tom, should we have the... Uh... Let's see. Let's see how you rate. Okay. Hands up. Let's have a show of hands, folks. We're all amongst friends here. <laughs> who, who scored 0 to 11? Oh, you're a nice oh. bunch. You're a nice bunch. <laughs> Look at that. That's, what, that's very, very reassuring. Okay. Okay. Who scored 12 to 17? Oh, this is fantastic. Nothing to worry about here, Jared. 12 to 17, <laughs> below average. Fantastic. OK, who scored 18 to 22? Ah, you can feel the tension rising can't you? as we edge towards the red end of the scale. Who scored 23 to 28? OK, OK. She's, she, she's sitting behind you there, my friend. <laughs> One, 20, one high. Is that all? Only one high. Who scored 29 to 33? Very good. Uh, that's marvellous. No one. No one very high. Well, there you go, folks. I mean, that actually is... We're not diagnosing anyone, OK? This is not a diagnostic test. 
It's a bit of fun. But it's a general, it's a general indication of, you know, how far along the psychopathic spectrum you might be, okay? Do not give this to your bank manager uh, or your partner or anything like that, okay? Um, okay, thanks. Well, but it's, uh, we have a lot of time for questions. Uh, well, you might have some questions. Uh, there is only one rule. Um, um, just ask a question. Don't start a lecture, because in that case, I'll have to be rootless. <laughs> there will be mics around. Where are the mics? Hello? Just a moment. There's a mic. Uh, stupid psychopaths. And Could you repeat the question because the mic didn't work? Oh, sorry. There are differences between stupid psychopaths and uh, smart psychopaths. There are many differences between uh, men and women. Uh, in between uh, normal people, there are also psychopaths. Maybe behind the table, I wouldn't know. <laughs> but, so, what, uh, what's the relevance of the term psychopath? If they're all over the place. <laughs> well, I, for, first of all, I don't. I, w I wouldn't. I, I agreed with everything you said there up until the last line, which uh, which is that they're all over the place, and that that is that is actually the key to the answer. They're not all over the place. Actually, it's a very very uh, small percentage of the population for a start. So that's the very first thing. However, the first part of your point is is very relevant. And the way I, I, I look at this is to say, well, if you have a cutoff point using these various questionnaires, I go back to the kind of the, the decathlon argument that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, two athletes might post the same overall points total, but get there in different ways. Now, I think what that does flag up is a paradox that we uh, are unable to delineate. Uh, the definitive psychopathic personality, but what we can do is we can flag up different psychopathic personalities. Now, one of the, if we're talking about from a legal and a clinical perspective, uh, if we go back to the dials on the studio mixing desk analogy, there is one dial which I left off, um, which is very predictive, um, irrespective of violence, uh, that's you know, another thing altogether, which is very predictive of whether you are going to be a dysfunctional or a functional psychopath, whether you're going to be a successful or an unsuccessful one, and that is impulsivity, okay? The impulsivity dial. If that impulsivity dial, in other words, the ability, um, you, you lack the ability to work for long-term goals, to delay your instant desires for the sake of of a, of a goal later on. If you are unable to do that, if your impulsivity dial is turned up very high, then that seems to be a very strong predictor of someone who will turn into a criminal psychopath as opposed to a non-criminal one, a, uh, an unsuccessful psychopath um, as opposed to a successful one. So from a clinical perspective, that dial, whether you're violent or not, does tend to predispose you to criminality or unsuccess. But I suppose you could say, and I always use an analogy when we're looking at a type, let's, let's think of it in terms of, of, of national identity. I mean, French people and Dutch people are both European, right? But is one more European than the other? On second thoughts, maybe don't answer that question, actually. <laughs> um, but so, you know, you can have different kinds of European people but you can't say really that one is more European than the other. So in a sense, any kind of diagnosis, whether it's psychopathy, whether it's depression, whether it's intelligence, IQ, whatever, you know, um, you could say, well, is there any relevance to the label intelligence? You know, but there's not just one kind of intelligence. So that would be my answer to that. Any other questions? This works, yeah. Just, just a moment. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I saw the, uh, uh, the diagnosis uh, scheme for Hannibal Lecter and at the bottom there were two uh, things, adolescence and uh, adult life. I, I don't exactly remember what the characteristics were of behavior in, in that. Uh, maybe a refresher? Anti-social behavior, yes, that's it. I was wondering, um, does this mean that there is a, a spectrum of anti-social behavior uh, 
in, in every human uh, from childhood to uh, when, they, when they become an adult. So are children antisocial per definition? Me? Yeah, okay. Um, I think uh, th all children behave in a, in a naughty way. All exactly. children are, 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 are by, you know, uh, by default naughty. Um, however, there is a subgroup of children um, who uh, have what we call in the, uh, the, the, the technical term for it is callous, unemotional traits. Now, these traits can sometimes show up as early as five years old. Um, and they're very noticeable, very, very noticeable. Um, and these children are your apprentice psychopaths. These are your, your, your children who are going to become psychopathic later in life. Um, they stand out a mile from other kids. Uh, so you're quite right. There is a spectrum of, you know, uh, naughty on the one hand um, and psychopathically naughty on the other hand. And these are the children which have the callous and emotional traits, and they, are, they do stand out a lot, and they, they are uh, targeted um, for uh, rehabilitation therapy. A colleague of mine in the UK has a, a very good program which is looking at that at the moment. But I, I, I want to add something to this answer. Um, it depends what you call antisocial. Mm. Uh, let <clears throat> me give you two examples. Uh, sexual harassment or sexual crimes. In our law system, it could be a rape when you give another a deep kiss. Uh, that was decided a few years ago. Before that time, it was not antisocial to give a deep kiss. Um, if we lower the mm. Uh, the, the, if we lower the, the, the what is left the, 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 the if we lower the age of 16 in our law for having sex with a minor or not, and we lower it to 15, then we have less antisocial figures. So it depends enormously of what do you call what the society is calling antisocial. Okay, there was another question right here. Just, just a moment, there will be someone with you. Um, regarding the special air forces, um, these people are also trained, so in how far is psychopath like natural something to someone, or is it trained if you look at uh, pro professions? Hmm. Can you be trained to, to become a psychopath? <laughs> well, I think if you're in the air force or being a soldier, you're trained in certain traits of a human being in order not to emphasize hmm. too much. All right. <clears throat> Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I, in my opinion, um, people that um, get into the British Special Forces, uh, the SAS, um, have it naturally. Um, and I'll give you a good reason for that. Um, it's because of the selection process. The selection process for British Special Forces, the, the British SAS is the equivalent of the American Navy SEALs, I, I, the guys that took out bin Laden. I, I don't know what the, whether, whether there's a Dutch equivalent to the Special Forces. Is, I've got, I've got. Okay, right. <coughs> <coughs> we cut our defense uh, right. okay, yeah, so yeah. we don't have it okay, anymore. Yeah. No, no, that's right, yeah. Okay, we're, we're happy to help, you know. Um, but um, I'll give you, when you look at, I'll give you an example, I'll tell you a little story. Um, I, I actually do work with the British Special Forces looking at selection, uh, various selection procedures. Now, um, roughly every year you get 200 members of the uh, British uh, uh, Armed Forces go for SAS selection. Uh, and these are already elite soldiers. These are already guys who come from the Parachute Regiment and the Royal Marines. Um, they're already pretty tough elite soldiers. Out of that 200, roughly about two or three will get through. Um, and it's an eight-month selection process. Now, within the fi when you enter the final week, you are down to about 10. Okay? These guys aren't huge big guys. Okay, some of them are, but they are just generally normal built people, but they are extremely physically fit, extremely physically tough, robust, and extremely mentally tough. Now, the final three days, these, let's say we've got 10 left, um, they are um, set out on the mountains with no equipment, and they're let out there for three days, uh, and they're finally caught. And when they're caught, they're interrogated. Um, and by this stage, they are tired, 
they are cold, they are disoriented, and they are starving hungry. Now, one particular interrogation which I um, witnessed um, had one of these recruits, uh, who's the final 10, remember, already very tough, uh, caught, uh, blindfolded, had a hood tied over his head, stripped naked, thrown into the back of a lorry, and then driven to a disused warehouse where he was taken out, handcuffed, and then he was put face down on the floor, uh, still blindfolded, at which point a big army lorry was driven towards him. Okay? Now, these big army lorries have got raised driver's cabins. So it drove so close to him that his head was under the cabin, and the tyre of the lorry was right here, at which time he was, had the blindfold taken off, uh, the driver got out, gave it a good rev, gave the engine a good rev to increase the vulnerability. Now, remember this guy's tired, cold, hungry, all those things, disoriented. At which point, the blindfold was then tied back on him, uh, and he heard footsteps walking away. And then he heard someone say, is the handbrake on? <laughs> at which point, the guy didn't know this at the time, because he's now blindfolded again, there was an instructor behind him who had a tyre in his hand, and started putting pressure on the side of his head with the tyre, so he thought maybe it was the lorry. Now, those kinds of things you can't train in people. Now, about seven or eight of those final ten gave up. It's not violence, it's playing with your mental state. But you get roughly two, one or two, who will, who will survive and say, that's it. That's before they've got into the regiment. Okay? Yeah. So these kinds of characteristics are selected for within the training, within the selection process. And quite rightly so, because some of the things they do are pretty frightening, you know, and even in training. They train with live ammunition, they use Heckler Cox submachine guns, fire 800 rounds a minute, you know, it's pretty scary stuff. So you can't really learn that kind of coolness under pressure on the job, not in that kind, not in that kind of sphere anyway. Any other questions? Over here. <coughs> Is it working? Okay. Actually, I was wondering if I could ask two questions. <laughs> yes? Go ahead. Um, my, I, both questions are actually uh, based around the answer of, from the previous one about adolescence and antisocial behavior. Uh, my first question is, you were mentioning so-called apprentice psychopaths, and you were saying they were very recognizable, and I was wondering, how are they so easily recognizable? Mm. Yeah, well, with, with it, in children, uh, yeah. the age of, say, five and seven, the, 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 one of the main um, predictors is cruelty to animals. Um, so uh, these children um, uh, either kill or torture animals and feel absolutely no remorse whatsoever. In fact, they enjoy it. Uh, also, fire setting, arson at a very young age, uh, is a predictor of these kinds of children. Uh, but also severe bullying, um, that kind of thing. So that, th th those kinds of you know, pretty severe behavioral problems uh, without any of the other behavioral problems. So they're very calm, they're very controlled. They don't have any other disturbances. Uh, so that's that's the first that's a very quick answer to the to that question. So they're like little Voldemort. Little Voldemort, you know the. Oh yeah, little Voldemort. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, could say that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, my second Sounds question a good was about uh, your colleague. You said that if those children can be sent to your colleague who's trying to. Well, I don't know what word you use, but basically my question is. Does it mean that if you are early enough, you can actually teach people to not be uh, psychopathic or? Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. My, my colleague, Laura Warren, in the UK, has got um, a, uh, a program. And it's called Let's Get Smart. Um, and it um, it's, it's, uh, targets kids who have callous, unemotional traits. Now, one of the things that we know about kids like this is like adult psychopaths. They do not give a damn about what people think of them. So punishment doesn't work on them. Okay? So you can, you can take all sorts of sanctions against these kids. You can punish them, you can do whatever you want, and it doesn't bother them. Because they are just not interested in pleasing adults. Okay? What adults might think of them has no impact on them at all. So what my colleague has done is thought of it in a different way. Uh, and she's looked at, rather than looking at punishment, she's looked at rewards. And rewarding these kids when they behave well. Okay? So these rewards are handed out by the adult in charge. 
and they are tailored to each child's interest. Uh, and they're also combined with role playing, and they're also combined with video feedback. So when the, when the child behaves badly and hurts another child or does something very bad, um, you can play the video back in an attempt to show them how their behavior impacts on other people. Now, that reward system, plus the video, plus the role play, is actually quite effective in, in changing these kids' behavior. And the rationale is this, that you cannot change the underlying emotional deficits that these kids have. But what you can do is provide them with a rational, hard-nosed reason to behave well, because they're getting something out of it. And what that does is it gets them to a level where they are then able to enter more mainstream rehabilitation programs. Now, one of the criticisms of that, of course, is that, well, aren't you just training them to be more manipulative? And it's a fair criticism. I think it's a fair criticism. But I think in answer to that, you have to think, well, if you don't do anything, isn't that worse? And at the moment, it seems that it does work. You, we are getting them early, and we are getting them at least to a situation where the behavior can be more manageable. OK. Thank you very much. OK. Hey, there is a judge who wants to ask you something. <laughs> what is, is that this gentleman on the right? On, on the yes. No. Um, I couldn't <laughs> help wondering, did you like being a psychopath for 30 minutes? How did you feel? Did you feel good, or did you have any urges? <laughs> I, I did feel good, yeah. I, th I felt very good, actually. And it's much, much cheaper than alcohol. <laughs> uh, I can just go to my colleague and get topped up every now and again with a bit of electromagnetic Jack Daniels. Um, yeah, it did feel good. It felt very good. And, um, you know, it, um, it, you know we, we went to the bar afterwards, and um, I played a, a, a video game which is called Gran Torino, which is a motor racing game. And I was far quicker on it. Uh, than I had been before because I, you know, I wasn't scared of taking risks. Um, I actually beat my previous score. It felt very, very good. Um, I, I can highly recommend being, being a psychopath <laughs> for half an hour. It's very funny, actually. Whenever you ask people if I could turn you into a psychopath for half an hour, what would you do with total impunity? You know, there's no comeback on you at the end of it. People fall into two different categories. One group of people say they would do terrible things to people that had done them wrong down the years. And the other group of people say that they would declare their undying love uh, for that person who they never declared their undying love for. Um, uh, so this is what you usually get. And, but of course, the, 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 the key word there is impunity. There is no comeback. There's no moral comeback. There's no legal comeback. There's no shame or embarrassment. Uh, and of course, that's exactly how it is to psychopaths. They don't care. They actually don't care. They, they, they do act with this sense of I don't care attitude. And I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of people have asked me, you know, well, what's the fascination with psychopaths? I think that's it right there. I think we envy psychopaths a little bit. We live in a society where our behavior is coming under closer and closer scrutiny. You know, in the, I don't know what the situation is in the UK, but in, 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 in Holland, but in the, in the UK, there's one closed circuit television camera for every 20 people. I think we're up to 1 billion people on Facebook now. Our behavior is coming under closer and closer scrutiny. And I think as that happens, we, we tend to envy people that just don't care. And I think that's possibly one of our fascinations with psychopaths. So this could, could be a huge attraction somehow. If you, it could, it if could you, be. You could bring this to market and you know, let us all well, try Well, yeah, we could do it. Unfortunately, it only works for half an hour. That's the only problem. And it's a massive piece of equipment. <laughs> So I can't see it catching on down the high street, really, you know. But uh, possible, yeah. Hey, we have here, Tamara. Um, from a forensic point of view, and maybe a question for all three gentlemen, I was wondering, is there, do you believe in treatment of psychopaths? Yeah, I mean, I, I, as I um, uh, just said earlier, when we look at um, children, uh, that particular kind of rehabilitation program is, is certainly working at the moment. I think traditionally, um, the idea of treating psychopaths within forensic settings is fraught with problems. Uh, and that is because one of the things that we know about psychopaths is that they are brilliant actors. Um, they are brilliant persuaders. Uh, they are experts at telling you what you want to know simply 
to get out of the unit that they're in, back on the streets, and commit further crimes. So this is a notorious problem with psychopaths. I think as time's gone on, there are, I mean, there are certain adult treatments now, which are in their early days, uh, which are working. Uh, one is called decompression, uh, which is intense one-on-one -on -one therapy uh, with psychopaths. Uh, that's um, uh, being done by a colleague of mine in America. Another um, kind of therapy uh, with another per, uh, colleague of mine in America um, is looking at how we might be able to control psychopaths' impulses. Remember I was telling you about that impulsivity dial that was turned up a bit earlier. Um, well, uh, a colleague of mine in America is l using biofeedback to do this. So at the moment he's looking at, uh, he, he's done this with addicts. So what you've got, let's say you've got a cocaine addict. Um, that cocaine addict is wired up to a computer. And um, on the computer screen in front, there is like a bar or a kind of a tower, um, which corresponds to their physiological reaction. So when they're showed um, a, a, a piece of cocaine, uh, that bar or tower is very high, okay? And they're then trained to kind of think about not having that drug and bring their biofeedback, their physiological levels down and reduce that digital bar on the screen. Now, that's actually working very well with rehabilitating drug addicts. Now, he's now thinking of actually using that within a forensic setting um, with sexual offenders uh, and with violent offenders, with violent psychopaths. So you, uh, you know, basically use biofeedback and get psychopaths to overcome that initial reaction, that initial impulse to just do something without thinking, get that kind of electronic bar down. Um, and, and gradually condition them to kind of just wedge in, just slot in that little bit of thinking time before they act. And it's in its early stages, but again, it shows signs that it might at least make some headway. I think uh, perhaps uh, uh, we, we can use treatment for Psychopaths who uh, have a high uh, figure of uh, pri uh, primary narcissism. We can try to treat to get them a secondary narcissism, less uh, difficult narcissism mm. as the primary narcissism. Mm. And we all often see that in the forensic practice here. Mm. Yeah. Is that correct? Uh -huh. Well, you know, the treatment, of, treatment of, of psychopathy is one of the most controversial uh, subjects, but uh, there are studies going on that show uh, some promise, and my point of view is that you should always try mm. to treat yeah. and never say they are, they are untreatable. They should have the opportunity yeah. to, uh, yeah, to have access to treatment, whatever mm. it may, may do. Mm. Well, well, well let, let's take an example. We have, you know, the famous doctor in, um, in the United States, they call him, uh, Dr. Death, because he is, uh, uh, he is practicing mercy killings. Mm. If we can treat him that he has to show less mercy, mm. that Maybe. probably would yeah. help. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, I saw some other people. Who, someone at the back over there. Who, okay, I'll keep that in mind. In uh, psychology, I hear the discussion of nature and nurture a lot. Uh, I don't see it in your story tonight. Is there anything known about uh, uh, nurture of the psychopath? Or is there any research about it? Yeah, yeah there's, there's quite a bit of research on, on that. Um, I'd like to bring to your attention, uh, whenever we talk about nature and nurture, um, I want to bring to your attention um, a, uh, a field, a new discipline, uh, which is emerging from the field of genetics, and it's called epigenetics. Um, now, epigenetics is basically the study of how the environment turns on different genes that we have naturally. Now, the analogy that I always use to help people understand this is to imagine uh, a book on a library shelf, okay? Now imagine that um, you, the, the text, the writing in that book is your genes, your genetic code. Um, if that book remains closed, then that writing, that information, is not going to have any impact in the outside world. 
Okay, it's going to remain dormant. However, if someone comes and picks up that book and opens it and starts reading those words, uh, then that information is going to have an impact. Now, that's exactly the way the environment interacts with our genes. Okay, we need an environmental trigger on some occasions to turn those genes on. In other words, to make that information become live. And that, uh, using the analogy, is the person coming over and opening the book. Now, when it comes to psychopathy, um, the general consensus at the moment is that psychopathy is about 50% genetic. There is a 50% genetic variation within psychopaths. But on a lot of occasion, it's environmental triggers in early formative childhood years. For instance, a violent or a traumatic childhood that is the equivalent of the person coming and opening that book and turning those genes on. Uh, and that kind of person generally becomes a violent criminal, a, a violent psychopathic criminal. Um, so well, Gerard and I were actually talking earlier before we came up here. There's another emerging discipline called neuro-law, and I'm sure Gerard has something to say on this, but um, neuro-law is, is um, a, um, a cross between forensic science and neuroscience. Um, and it's been discovered that there is a gene not to get too technical with you, it's um, a genetic polymorphism um, on the, it's called an MAOI inhibitor gene, um, that the media is calling the warrior gene. Mm. Now, if you have the short version of this gene, there is an 85% chance that if you have a violent childhood, you will become violent. However, there is, it's a strange gene, this, because if you have the long version and you have a violent childhood, it protects you against becoming violent. Okay, so it depends whether you've got the long or the short version. You can turn out to be very different. Now, the test case, there was a case, I think it was in 2007, in Utah, in the United States, where they have the death penalty for murder. And there was a man called Bradley Waldrop who uh, murdered his wife's friend with a hatchet, uh, chopped her up, and attempted to murder his wife, but she survived. Um, and his defense attorney uh, brought him to the witness stand and had him tested for the warrior gene beforehand. And the first question, I'm dramatizing a little bit, that his defense attorney asked him was, um, do you have the warrior gene? Yes, I do, uh, replied Bradley Waldrop. The second question his defense attorney asked him was, were you abused as a child? Yes, I was, replied Bradley Waldrop. Therefore, his defense attorney put to the jury, um, surely my client's free will has been diminished compared to someone who doesn't have that gene and who wasn't violently abused as a child. Well, that particular line of argument changed his death penalty, his death sentence, to a life sentence. And the premise of the argument is this, that if we're not free to choose our genes, and if we're not free to choose our environment, are we free to choose at all? And I think, I predict that in later years, and I think it's just coming through the courts in the UK now, there will be a whole load of cases which will come under this umbrella term of neuro-law. And this is where the law starts getting involved in moral philosophy and all sorts of complicated uh, kind of academic subjects. Gentleman in front. You had a question? Just a moment. Hi, I have a question. Um, in the political debate of the last, what shall we say, last half year, the attention has gone more to the, um, to the um, victim than to the um, offender. Um, my question uh, is about uh, self-determination and self-will. Um, there is also a, an interest in, uh, in Holland uh, about, um, how do you call it, um, victim Victimization. mediation, uh, slachtoffer bemiddeling, mm. um, as in to help the, the offender and the victim to, yeah, to get their emotions together, to, get, you know, to go on with their lives. The, the offender uh, shows remorse, the uh, victim shows uh, the offender what, you know, what the offender has done with the other's life. 
What is the role and position of a psychopath in this context? If he has no self-will and self-determination. He has to listen to his criminal defense lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Just, then he has a chance. Mm. We have time for one last question. Over there. Um, if you can have two questions, because this lady next to me really wants to ask a question. Um, my question is, if it's possible, my name is Suma Mirza, by the way, if it's possible to turn yourself into a psychopath for half an hour, is it possible to turn psychopaths into normal people for half an hour? <laughs> and then, going further on that, is it also possible to change their view on remorse within that half an hour if they have to look as normal people to a videotape of themselves doing some really strange crimes in the past. So can we change them looking at their own behavior in that half an hour and turn them maybe when they're for half an hour normal people, look the, uh, plant some remorse into them? Is yeah. that possible? It's possible for half an hour. But I, I, think, I think the problem with any psychopath that I've ever... And it's a, it's a good question. I mean, we could do it. We could reverse it with, with TMS. And as I was saying to the, the, the lady here, um, one of the things that, we, we, uh, that my colleague uh, looks at with children with callous, unemotional traits um, is, is video playback. So that kind of thing is already being done with, with, with children, at least. I think one of the things that I've, uh, and I'm sure Gerard and Antoine would, would agree with this, one of the things that, that, that I uh, note with, with a lot of psychopaths that I've dealt with is the fact that although they might, you know, pretend to be remorseful and mm. pretend to feel bad, actually, you know, a lot of psychopaths think that they're perfectly okay, thank you. And actually the problem is with you, you know. If, if, if you know, if I've conned you, that, that was one of the questions which we had in the test, if I've conned you, you deserve it. You know, it's not my problem. You know, you deserve it. Um, um, you know, if, if, you know if, if, if a woman is raped, uh, you know, usually you find, well, she was asking for it. She led me on. You know, she shouldn't be walking around like that. She, you know, she, that was her problem, not mine. So psychopaths tend to be very, you know, it, it's other people's problem. They're actually fine. So in terms of later life, getting them to see, you know, or feel what you're trying to say, remorse, would be probably, they would probably see that as a, a weakness. But they also can simulate it. In, exactly, yeah. And in my experience, a psychopath, one of the basic elements is they are cheating you. Yeah. Cheating everyone all of the place. Even the toilet paper they use, they are falsing and cheating. Everything. How can you cheat toilet paper? What? How can you cheat on toilet paper? <laughs> You, 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 can, you can commit f uh, forgery and uh, falsehood with toilet paper. I think, I think this is an excellent uh, closing remark <laughs> for this evening. Uh, Gerard and Kevin, I would like to thank you very much for being here and taking part in the discussion and enlightening us on this uh, subject uh, uh, tonight. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming here in such great number. And, uh, uh, well, I, uh, I trust that you leave this room with a profound understanding of the subject of psychopathy. And if that is not the case, you will find everything you would like to know in this beautiful book. Thank you.